All right. Hey, folks. Uh, let's see. Are we up and running? Doing a mic check. Mic check. One, two, three. Doing on. Checking that. Let's see if it's coming through. It should be coming through okay. Um, let's see if I am live at this point. Just waiting. <clears throat> All right. Hey, folks. It looks like we're up and running. All right. Hey, folks. Yep. It looks like we're yep, up and yep. running. Yep. There we go. All right. Cool. Hey, my name is Phil Kearney. I create role-playing games. I illustrate them. I publish them online. And today we are working on uh, token assets uh, for ship combat and exploration on ship-to-ship -ship combat uh, maps and exploration maps using Spelljammer Combat and Exploration. Uh, this is a supplement that we just published to, like last week on dmsguild.com. Um, you can check that out in the description down below here if you want to see it. The, the assets that we are creating today are going to be included in the zip file that, uh, that you get when you pick up and purchase this thing. As you can see here, there's a zip file as well as the PDF itself. So you can check that thing out if you want. Um, uh, the full playlist of all 360 episodes that we've accumulated so far uh, that, that is here. So if you think this stuff is cool today, or I stream 11 times per week, so if you think this stuff is fun, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon to get notifications in the future, and we'll get to work. So um, let's see. Did we build this thing up? Um, what, are we doing this right now? Hold on. Did we? Yeah, you guys aren't seeing anything that I'm doing because I had my windows in the way. Right. <laughs> So yeah, you can see here uh, the, uh, the 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 spell general document here. It comes with a zip file and a PDF when you purchase it. Uh, so you can check that out at the link uh, right uh, right here. And then here is the full playlist of all 360 episodes. Like, subscribe, bell icon, notifications. I just posted on Twitter that I'm live. You can follow me on the X Twitter platform at Phil Kearney if you're interested. Otherwise, I'm here 11 times per week. So I built this book cover back at episode 40. You can see that. Uh, no, 15. You can see construction of this if you want uh, by just checking the Wayback Machine on the playlist. And uh, so we are, we're going to create some, uh, some individual token assets. If you, uh, like for example, let's take a look at, um, like here's a squid ship that we created. This is a token that already exists in the zip file. But you can see there's an array of different types of weapons here. There's an arcane cannon, uh, harpoon flingers, which are these small five foot mounted weapons that are basically anti-personnel weapons. A uh, arcane um, cannon is a magic amplifier that can be used uh, with uh, cantrips to do anti-personnel damage, kind of like uh, harpoon flingers. And you can spend spell slots or monsters with uh, unlimited spell-like abilities can uh, have a cooldown, a recharge die to convert the cannon into um, siege weapon damage. Uh, we have some ballistas here and a trebuchet. Obviously, this is zoomed in a lot. Uh, this is probably as close as you need to get on a combat map uh, of like 50 foot squares or even 500 foot squares. This is as close as you're going to get to it. But um, we want to extract these assets so that we can just have them as tokens that can be included in the content that we provide. So here is our production and our spell jammer tokens. Uh, we go down to final production. Here is the PDF. Um, here is a zip file. Now, I, I, obviously, I can't open that, so foolishness. Uh, here, here is all of the folders that are in the. So we'll we'll drop uh, the ship weapon tokens into uh, this pile here. Let's make a new folder. Let's call it um, uh, weapon tokens. Like we go to the ship, like the ship tracking sheet. Uh, we have all the uh, the different like for example, let's grab uh, let's grab a squid since that's what we were looking at here for a moment. Um, ship tracking star moth turtle ship squid. There you go. So here's a squid ship. It's got the different weapons here. One, two. So you got piercing rams here. You've got grappling tentacles here. Uh, you've got a trebuchet on the back deck here. There's four ballistas, two here, and uh, two here. Uh, an Eldritch Cannon up top, and then Harpoon Flingers that we have on the back deck. So, and this is the same token that we saw just a moment ago here in higher resolution. 
Uh, this is just a tracking sheet so that while you're conducting battle, you have a quick reference card to the different weapon systems that are available to your characters and the crew aboard the ship. Uh, here's the, the class of the vessel, the size of it, the space that it occupies in combat. You can see here's a one, two, three, four, five by one, two, three, four, five feet at the 50 foot scale. This is a five by five space, so it's 250 feet. And as you can see, it's a, it can squeeze down to about 50 feet in size. If it were to slim itself, if it were to slim down its grappling tentacles and crook its sails so that it could fit inside this space, this thing could squeeze through a space only 50 feet wide. Um, the materials, it's light wood, so it doesn't have any modifications to strength, constitution, or dexterity. Uh, its armor class is 13 plus. The, uh, in, this, in the book, it explains that you can add your dexterity. Light material can add their dexterity modifier to armor class. Um, it has a damage reduction of 10 for um, uh, shrugging off some incoming siege damage, and it has a total of 500 hit points. Its weight is 100 tons unto itself. It can carry as cargo 400 tons and maintain full speed. It has a total towing capacity of 900 tons, minus the weight of cargo that you carry. On terrain, it, it can't really land on solid ground. It just kind of tips over when it does. Um, I mean, you could drop it on the ground, but it it isn't designed to traverse that surface. You'd have to pick up and start flying again to go across land. It can land on liquid and use its sails to do so. Against the wind, it's 15, and still in um, uh, in normal circumstances, it's 35 feet per round, and then uh, with the wind, it's uh, 50 feet per round. So it's about uh, six miles per hour that it can move just with the sails. Obviously, flying at 100 million miles allows it to pick up a lot more speed than that. Just has to pick its butt up out of the water and then again start flying. You can only go so fast in the water before you start causing trouble. So uh, this allows you to uh, to traverse the surface like a normal sailboat to like slide into docks, like in water deep or other places that have uh, aquatic um, mooring for any types of ship that can traverse water surfaces. So that's a quick gist of this. We have a character. We have a a combat sheet for each of these, but the request was to extract these uh these token assets specifically so that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time doing here so let's get that out of the way i think uh i think the way that we want to do this is here's the gear that we have i think i'm going to drop a black background here just take okay so there's the helm itself uh, which is a five foot space that uh, you can occupy or um uh, what's the words I want to use? Um, you can either um, sit in, uh, occupy the space of or adjacent to the helm and be able to focus on it to operate the, the helm and thus operate the ship that the helm is attached to. And you either have a minor helm or a major helm. Um, minor helms can move ships up to 50 feet in size and major helms can move ships up to 500 feet in size. Uh, major helms have 100 million miles per day um, speed, and which is 10,000 miles per round. And let's see, let's crop. Interesting. I'm going to do this. Minor helms have a uh, 50 mile, uh, uh, sorry, a, um, a uh, 1 million mile per day maximum speed, which is, uh, which is 100 miles per round, which is well above combat speeds. Fight, like these little fighter craft, they craft little, little 50 foot craft, they are not designed to go across like months of travel time. Unless you put a major helm on it, you can, but they're so small, you can't even really maintain a lifestyle aboard it. So if you're gonna be on a ship for months on end, you're basically chewing on rations and giving yourself saddle sore all the time. There's no real room to roam around. The, the, the bigger ships, like the 50 foot ships, those those are decent enough size that you could potentially get away with it. But if you really wanna travel long distances over time, you're going to wanna have a vessel that's large enough to be able to do it. I'm going to trim this down to 2.25. Center that up. So what is this? Um, 700 pixels? 225 pixels, okay. Let's see. We're going to file. Let's get rid of that. File. Save as. 
Cooter. Ship, ship tracking sheet, map token assets. Ships. go with um, um, weapon and gear tokens. Helm. PNG file. Yeah, we can, we can call it PS. We can do that. Helm. And then we can resave it. Save as. Helm. There we go. And then we can duplicate the arcane cannon. New. Merge. This is called uh, production assembly work. And for the most part, it's boring as shit. <laughs> so I appreciate anyone that wants to hang out and kick around and, uh, and have conversation about stuff. We'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll see if there's any cool conversation pieces that fire up as a course of, uh, through the course of today's stream. But um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Let's make sure that's nice and centered. You're looking good there, buddy. Get rid of that. And then we're gonna go to Arcane Cannon. So we're going to save as. Here, um, I've only got like four more of these, and then we're going to start uh, plucking and building asteroids. So, let's see. Hang loose with me here for a few minutes. Eldritch cannon. P yes. And then uh, save as. There we go. PNG. Eldritch cannon. And let's go back to here, get rid of that, and then we'll go back to here. Let's grab a harpoon flinger. Harpoon flingers are from Descent into Avernus. Uh, they're mounted on the back of the um, Infernal War Machines, which is what um, we were actually working on Infernal War Machine uh, vehicle mechanics when uh, Spelljammer dropped. So was, uh, the, the vehicle mechanics were already working fantastic. We had worked out pursuit mechanics and, uh, and, and fixed object obstacle mechanics where like you're, you're moving around obstacles uh, as opposed to a pursuit where you're both basically going down an endless track of road with minor variation, but everyone's basically able to move in the same direction. So when you're moving your movement per round around an object, it's when you're accelerating and decelerating and drifting. You're not turning and then moving this direction and then turning and moving this direction. When everyone's moving the same direction together, you're just simply drifting. So like when you turn the wheel to the right, but you're moving 100 miles per hour, you're just drifting over to the side, but still going in that direction. So that's a different style of movement which is pursuit movement on a pursuit map. The map stays the same, like the squares, like if you're in a 10 by 10 grid of 50 foot squares and you've got some Mad Max trucks that are going down the road or fighter ships that are streaking down a canyon that, that you might have, you might zoom out to the overall canyon. The canyon might be a thousand miles long, but you traversing the space inside of that canyon, you might only be moving at 500 feet per round because if you're overclocking the speed of the canyon and you have to make a turn, you might have to make a, uh, a, a, like a, a piloting check to be able to swerve and avoid the obstacle that's coming in faster than your movement speed um, per round. Like if you've got like a, a 50 foot obstacle that is large enough that your ship would have to move out of the way, but you're moving a thousand miles per round, you're going to collide with that 50 foot object and cause collision and potentially destroy your ship and kill your crew. So you can only move as fast as the obstacles and the terrain that you're inside of, regardless of what your maximum speed is. You have to be able to match the maneuver, the, the size of the objects that you're engaging with to be able to avoid and swerve around maneuverability so that you don't cause damage. So that's, that's a, an interesting, that was an interesting mechanic that evolved out of, uh, out of all the playtesting. 
and uh, has really served the project overall very well. So let's go merge down there and we'll conceal that. And then we'll extract this. So once the spell generator book came out, it became pretty evident that uh, that all the spell like all the vehicle mechanics we had made for descent into Avernus were going to work fantastic for spell jammer, and because of the hovering capability and and perfect maneuverability that um, uh, that wizards had um, uh, basically decided for uh, this is going to be a harpoon flinger there uh, because of that hovering um, that hover flight perspective that. Uh, Wizards adopted for 5e that gave us all the maneuverability that we needed for ships to be able to perform the exact same way It's it's been a blessing. It's just like everything that was in uh, Spelljammer's Adventures in Space fits perfectly by nature with our system So everything that's in this book just naturally curves into what Wizards had It's almost like Wizards didn't have the time to think this deep into the mechanics that they were building I like to think if they had had the opportunity that they would have come up with something similar to this, but I mean, you know, we'll never know. So I just think it's super cool. So let's duplicate the ballista here. We'll go to the harpoon flinger and check this out here. Let's add this back in. Uh, the um, ones that are interested. PDF. Hey. I don't care what's new with Microsoft Edge. Uh, so here's the actual document. If you scroll down here, to early, the spell jamming ships for vessels and crafts, explaining the difference between the two, how gravity planes and air envelopes work. And the ship statistics, this is providing everything that you need to build your own ships. So you can just, it's, it's showing like the amount of weight that you can carry, like your weight, your cargo, and your towing limits based on the size of the craft or vessel that you're controlling, the cost uh, per five feet in length that it has. Here's a slew of regenerated ships that are all from Spelljammer's Adventures in Space, as well as a fighter craft that we designed. Here's a uh, basically a, a, a layout chart of all the different types of ships that are there and then we just earlier showed you the, the ship tracking sheets um, so that you could easily uh, consolidate all the information on this uh, to be able so you could build your own ship you could illustrate it if you you know if you want to draw your own ship you certainly can but you can just basically take a grid and then like create the outline of your ship and then you can take these assets that we're producing and drop them onto the uh, and, and then drop them into the position that they belong in That's good space. I'm just gonna save this here. This is a ballista, ballista, ballista. Save as, save as, ballista. And then file, save as again with the PNG. Harpoon Flinger is also five feet. It occupies a five foot space. That's why I'm doing this. Five feet. And then the helm typically occupies a five foot space. And then we have Ballista, 10 feet. Let's go back to uh, trebuchet. Duplicate that. Trebuchets are 15 by 15. That was the wrong way to do it. Let's go to size perfect and then let's blot out the dark 
file, save as to your computer, tricochet. And then file, save as computer equals PNG. PNG, trebuchet, 15 feet. Trebuchets do D10, uh, do D8 times 10 damage. Ballistas do D4 times 10 damage. And Manganel do D6 times 10 damage. Let's duplicate this layer. Ballista have a uh, reload score of three. Manganel have a reload score of five. Let me turn this one on. And Trebuchet have a reload score of seven. And you use proficiency dice. If, you're, uh, if your proficiency bonus would normally be a plus two, your proficiency die is a D4. If your proficiency bonus would normally be plus four, uh, it is a, uh, it's a D8. So um, D4, D6, D8, D10, and then at 17th level with a plus six bonus is a D12. And so when you roll the die, instead of when you're making an attack roll, you roll a D20 plus your ability modifier or depending often rank, and, uh, and then your proficiency die, and you, instead of your proficiency bonus, you roll those things together that gets your attack, uh, your attack results to see if you hit the armor class of the target that you're attacking. And then whatever it is that you rolled on that proficiency die while you're making the attack roll, you measure that, you, you compare that result to the reload score of the weapon. So if you're rolling a D8 and you rolled a seven, you're capable of reloading a trebuchet as part of the attack so you can fire that weapon again. And this is assuming that you have a crew of seven siege crew that are working the weapon with you to uh, load, aim, and fire the weapon during a round of combat. You've got a lot of action economy amongst a bunch of people that allows you the opportunity to uh, be able to load and fire the weapon multiple times per round. The less people you have than you're supposed to, it increases the reload score. So if you're supposed to have seven people on that trebuchet and you're missing two of them, instead of a seven, it's a nine. And the more experienced a crew has, the higher rank they become. Uh, they start at level one and they can get up to level five. And the reload score is reduced by the rank of the crew. So if you have a, reload, a, a ballista with uh, three crew members that are first rank is gonna have a reload score of two. Uh, a first level commander with a reload score, with a reload die or proficiency die of a D4 can reload and fire that ballista again during the same round of combat when they roll a two, three, or four on a four-sided die. So it's highly likely they'll be able to do so. If the crew is second rank, it's minus two, it becomes a one, you can automatically fire a ballista all the time. But it only does up, it only does D4 times 10 damage. So a lot of that damage is gonna get shrugged off by a ship's damage reduction. Ballistas, you, if you fire a volley, a bunch of ballistas all at the same time, then it would be, uh, uh, XD4 times 10, like you fire three ballistas, it would be 3D, three ballistas, 3D4 times 10 damage. As a, kind of like a cantra, uh, kind of like magic missile, it'd just be considered one hit. And the reload score, if you had like, if you reduce the reload score for each ballista to one because you have a second rank crew, it'd be one plus one plus one, the reload score now becomes three. So a first level character that's commanding a volley of three ballistas together is gonna have to roll a three or a four on their D4 when they make the attack roll, if the attack roll succeeds, all 3d4 damage hits. But you also, if you miss the, if you don't roll a three or four on your reload die, then you're going to have to spend a reaction, bonus action, or action uh, slash attack, resetting each weapon individually. So you can either have a lot of action economy or garbage action economy reloading stuff, or you can have multiple characters working in tandem with you where one is specifically holding attacks for your assistant, your support character to help reload all the weapons using up their action economy so that you as the fighter fire a volley. And then like, I don't know, maybe you have a bard that's working with you and they're using their action, bonus action, reaction to reload those three weapons. And now your fighter has another attack 
fires all weapons again. That allows you, as you gain levels, to deal more damage with ships more reliably so you can take on larger threats. Fun stuff. Fun, fun stuff. So we're looking at, uh, oh, that's right, Manganel. Manganel. There. And then we'll go File, Save As, Computer, PMG. supposed to write 10. Ten feet. There you go. <clears throat> so now I can take this and this and this and this, this and this. I can copy those and go to the final and go to damn it. Let's go back to here. Final. Let's open up the PDF. Map tokens and stuff. Ships, uh, create a new folder. Oh, fudge, I can't just create a new folder. Uh, I can go to, nope, this isn't the way. Let's, uh, let's pull from there. Let's go to the actual folder where all this stuff is at, ships. Ship weapons, gear token, there we go. Back out here, we can copy this. Back out, back out. Let's go back into here. Map ships token stuff. Ships. Drop that in, open this up. We can get rid of this, 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 and this. Read all those. Cool, and now we got one, two, three, four, five, six. There's our assets. Hey, Hornetico, how you doing, my guy? Uh, looks like that's sitting pretty now. There. Okay, cool. So that's taken care of. Grid. Let's just put everything back the way we found it. Hit the save button, put everything back in place, and then let's drop out of that. And then let's go to open. And uh, so we're creating we're creating tokens, right? So I just finished making all the weapon and gear tokens for ships so that uh, people that download the document off of uh, Dames Guild can start uh, adding assets into their own maps as they please. And uh, let's see, we want to go to Spelljammer, and then we want to go to Production, and then we want to go to uh, Trash Tokens Cover, BTT, LTA, Mining, Vocath, Interior Pages. I think we want to be over here in Interior Pages. Done. Uh, locks. Civil upside down, room space, mama hunts, Niyogi, Niyogi. Let's, uh, how about we go to, let's go to the mama hunt and look at extracting some of these assets. So here's a bunch of asteroids. I think I want to extract, uh, I think I want to extract asteroids from the mama hunt here, the, uh, the Niyogi hunt, and, uh, and then from some of the interior art pages. So I think I want to crack open a PD, um, uh, notebook uh, a notepad document here real quick and then let's go back here and here let's see where are some fun asteroids for me to pluck like I could like I could pluck this one uh, these are decent these are just decent assets right uh, so what page is this uh, page 19. And where's some more good ones? Oh, this is a good page. Uh, 
Ba 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 Give me some more token assets for my asteroid fields for me right now, please. Ba 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 Is that it? Surely you have more asteroids, thank you. Uh what is this? Page 43. That might be that might be it. I think that's it. We'll see if we can extract some of these, 58. Not my highest priority, but we can see. Let's take a sip of water while I hunt. I still love this piece of art. God damn, what a great piece. This was so fun to build. Ugh, so fun. So much fun art in this book. This was such an awesome project to work on. Just loved it. Oh, yeah. Those uh, those have some value. Where are we at? 79. Those will be easily extracted. All this art was just so much fun to make. <clears throat> and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Nyogi Hunt. These, uh, these are on a separate map. So we can just extract these. Yeah, those will be useful. Okay, cool. I think we're good. And we'll just have those sit there for now. So what were we, what are we gonna do? We're going to just start extracting assets, I guess. Um, let's see, so we're gonna muck this thing up a little bit. Combine that there, there. Let's see. I just want to isolate everything from each other. Uh, get rid of the grids. There we go. Now I can realistically just start piucking these. duplicate this layer let's try doing that duplicate the layer and then we'll create a new one image crop crop zoom in image canvas size pixels Save as here, and we want to create a new pocket. So let's go to Spell Jammer, and then Final, and then Maps and Tokens, and then Mapping Tools, Icons, Letters, Numbers, and Asteroids. We'll go asteroid one. Save as Asteroid 2. <laughs> Let the nonsense begin. File, open. 
open. There we go. Cancel there. Flip that out. So, yeah, just grab some rocks. We're just grabbing some rocks over here, y'all. Asteroid 3, save, conceal, open. And maybe we, maybe we can grab a cluster of these dudes and jumble them all together. Uh, copy, paste, there we go. So all of these will be included in the zip file for the Spelljammer Combat and Exploration document. I could probably extract these separately. Let's find another one. Just do a little edging cleanup here. Frenetico, man, what do you got going on? I'm going to be spending time off screen today, uh, continuing to work on the uh, Eberron adventure. Uh, we're uh, cleaning up the logic and uh, and uh, how adventure, uh, like how the different challenges are framed in the uh, in the third act, making sure everything's just properly organized. Hey, thanks, Timely Timer. So I'm just going to spend a couple hours this morning making asteroids like this, and then we'll. I already did this this chunk of. Oh, yeah, let's grab this guy. He looks like he's ready to party. Hey, wanna party? Bump, bump, dump, bump, 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 I think that's you know, good enough. Hold on, let me just drop this guy in here like that. And then free transform, give it a twist. That'll do. File, save as. Asteroid cluster. Asteroids and asteroid clusters. That seems to make sense, right? 
Let's go back to here. Let's go to map tokens, mapping tools, icons, asteroids. Cool, we don't have this guy yet. Let's just grab him. Biggins. File, save as PNG four. Well, I think what I think I'll do is uh, is just drop these into the folder and then also make it a pay what you want. Um, that can be included. Maybe we'll just do a shitload of tokens. Put some of them in Lazarax, and then add a bunch more as a pay what you want, and then make that pay what you want a coupon. So the, as the asteroid assets would be five bucks that will reduce down to one dollar in the bundle, and then the Spelljammer Combat and Exploration will add some of them, uh, along with the weapon tokens, to the zip file, and that's twenty dollars currently, but we offer a five dollar coupon to drop it down to fifteen dollars. So we could then bundle them together to be $15 for Spelljammer and then an extra dollar for all of the pay what you want assets instead of being a $5, uh, yeah, instead of being a $5 thing, make it a $1 thing. That, uh, I think that feels pretty good. I like, I like that. And it's pay what you want, so you could choose to pay for it or not and then get and just use it as a discount coupon for you to be able to just pick up um, Spelljammer Combat and Exploration for... 15 bucks that way we can just add it back to the mill and keep moving forward with it that feels good that feels real good so then you pay whatever you want for the assets and then you can use that to bundle and get the, the spell gem combat and exploration down to 15 easy peasy This stuff is so meditative. I really just enjoy it. I think I'll do. I think we'll do ten of these for now. Just go. Just go around the world and look for more asteroids. What is the image? Canvas size. Pixels. Yeah, there you go. Save as PNG. Six and then file open. Nope. Let's see. 
I can just grab some more rocks for a cluster. Let's just make another cluster. Go grab, yeah, ooh, fun little net. Okay, yeah, let's, let's grab this little bundle over here. You know what I would, one, two, three, four, five, okay. What I, would, what I would like to do eventually is do a 500 foot scale um, uh, Dwarven Citadel. Which are just basically like asteroids that they carve into the shape of like weapons or or like dwarven king facades or whatever, and then they clean out all the ore inside of the rock. And once it's all done, they'll just launch it at something that they want to destroy, like uh, like a like a scrow base, for instance. They'll just, they'll just draft this. They'll just drop it on the scrow place to just to, to detonate it and, and to cause a, a massive crater, and then go start a new asteroid someplace else. So, um, but uh, in this case, uh, the idea that I have for uh, Topolis Tower, ultimately, is that this is the fragmented remains of a Dwarven Citadel, and inside of these larger rocks, there's chambers, and like, um, it, it, I could rebuild this, so like on some sides, there's just like gaping holes that lead into caverns, or, uh, or, or have like little, little pieces of like, um, like dungeon rooms that were like, uh, like the living quarters or like munitions or storage and stuff inside of the citadel. And now that it's all shattered in pieces, there's just fragments of dungeon maps sitting inside of these rocks. So, um, to so Topola sets up shop here because she wants to explore and understand the Dwarven Citadel. So as we get further and further into developing assets for Spelljammer in, in time to come, that's one of the cool things that we can do once we build the floor plans for Dwarven Citadel overall, like a 500 foot rock. I can then start taking chunks of that and then overlaying them on these rocks. It's like this is like where the mess hall was. This was the uh, the helm room, like where the face is, and it's been broken apart. So there's fragments of the helm room in here that they can study. Stuff like that. Neat ideas. Uh, yeah, I wanted to. Oh, I already grabbed that. Um, but that's that's some of the cool stuff that we can do with the system that we built here to be able to expand on different types of adventures that you can have. So there could be like magical traps and like uh, think like ghosts and stuff that can that can augment uh, the Topola Tower. Uh, um, region for adventure if the team wants to spend more time there. That feels pretty good. Let's merge these together so they're all in the same plane so I can scoop them around. I'm going to do a free transform with a twist. This will give it a twist as well. Yeah, that feels pretty good. Save as computer PNG asteroid cluster T. And hey, here's another fun little cluster, right? Uh, maybe we can. Yeah, let's, just, let's grab this guy. He's an interesting shape.
We'll do 10 of these and then we'll move to another map with a different style. Open. Nope, I don't need to open right now. I just need to be here. I don't know what I'm thinking. Um, nee, 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 nee. Let's do, uh, let's do like this. Let's grab these two and then a bigger rock. Two, and then we'll grab this guy. Boy, I, I sure did a lot of hours of painting, painting rocks. <laughs> it's uh, it's nice to see that I can I can uh, make uh, uh, recycle and make more use of them. Let's uh, let's put this one here, and maybe there's another little stone we can drop in. Yeah, I bet this guy's the right size. Sure enough. File. Save as. PNG. Asteroid cluster. What do we got? Um, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have three clusters, so I think I'm okay with those clusters. And then let's go. Uh, yeah, three more. Just need three more. Let's go find three more. Oh, I bet this one fits. And if it doesn't, we'll just recycle. So it does. Nope. Copy. Paste. Woof. Biggin. I was right. Just a bit too big. Shrink it down just a touch there. There we go. File save as PNG. Yes, two more. Ooh, let's just grab these two. Grab this one instead. I've already got a few clusters. I don't need another. Eh, yeah, I do. I want another cluster. Let's let's do another cluster. First, we'll drop this guy into place. And...
There we go. File, save as. PNG. 7 and 8. I think I'm okay with that. Mama Asteroids. Let's file. Save as. Icon Asteroids Mama Rocks. So come back and visit all this stuff another time. Drop you out of frame for now. File open. Let's go find production interior pages. Axis, and we'll do the uh, Nyogi Hunt. How are we doing on time? Cool. Uh, you know what? Let's go. Let's go take a look. Hold on. Let's take a closer look. Uh, here's the trimmed one. Yeah. Okay. This will do. <laughs> let's see. What do? How do I want to pull these together? Get rid of black and white. Uh, we can get rid of the color grid. Floor, black background. Don't need the numbers. Yeah, I think we've got some fun assets we can pluck from here. So let's see. We want to make it a transparent background. And um, how do we want to do this? Let's just do like, let's start here like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, no. Huh, so how about, what's the canvas size here? Uh, pixels, what, 600? How's that do? Mm, a little bigger than I need. Hold on. Let's do that instead. Let's make cleanup easier.
packaging. Make them look a little cleaner. A little less pixely around the edges by just hemming it off a little bit there. There we go. Easy peasy. Dig a niche out of there. Here a little bit, add some, a little bit of pepper. I spent a lot of time making asteroids, man. Boy, we spent probably 20 hours on stream just making rocks. <laughs> Those are fun times though, man. I really enjoyed how much of this project we live streamed. That was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to, uh, I'm looking forward to Monday and, uh, and continuing that with Eberron. Feels pretty good. Uh, now let's uh, grab some of this. Let's do it like that. Go in here and rearrange you a bit for transform. Spin that a touch. Drop it in here like that. And grab here. And go to there. Here and then put transform twist plop. Feels pretty good. And uh, perfect. All right, cool. So then let's uh, emit and let's do that image crop and uh, image canvas size in pixels 400 400 No, spell jammer, production, no, spell jammer, final, maps and tokens, mapping tools, icons, asteroids. Cluster four. bad let's uh yeah make it fit proper here do some cleanup Maybe, uh, maybe I'll end up doing like a hundred asteroids and clusters and then putting that into a, a $5 uh, token packet. That makes sense. And then again, bundle it down to only $1 with the uh, Spelljammer Combat and Exploration. 
make combat and exploration. So it'd be twenty. Be twenty, and eh, maybe we'll make it four dollars. Four dollars for a hundred assets, and then um, individually it'd be one dollar. So it'd be twenty-four dollars worth of uh, um, supplement and tokens, and bundled down to sixteen. That feels that feels pretty good. I, I think I like that. Let's uh, push this out a bit here. This a bit here. File. Save as. Actually, you know what? No, I think uh, I think I want another another piece. I like that a lot. Transform. Twist. Dark. Twist. Nice. I like that. And then we can free transform. down clean that up a bit watch the uh, watched an episode uh eh, watch two episodes of the the new netflix avatar tv show and by god it's it's fucking garbage <laughs> I, I i i squarely do not enjoy the new avatar live action show it's certainly better than what Shyamalan produced but it's still dog crap it's rushed it assumes that you've seen the show, so like a lot of the the character developed, the emotions are vacant, the the actors just aren't pulling it off. It's a really good Sokka, um, who the the actor that that they cast for Sokka is excellent, but um, and Eero is pretty good, but for the most part, that the kids, I, I don't like the kids. I mean, you know, kid actors have a hard time acting, which is why in voice acting you often have a um, a female voice actress um, portraying younger kids because her voice is higher, but they have the emotional depth of experience of being able to know how to modulate their, their emotion and to be able to naturally express it. Kids' problem with emotions is that they haven't had enough of them long enough to really understand how they work. So they can't, they can't really act them well. They're not much better than trained dogs, honestly, because they're just kids, man. The fuck are you supposed to expect from kids? File. Save as. It's a computer. PNG. Cluster number five. Concealed? <clears throat> Take it with a salt lick. I will say though, uh, um, after after being thoroughly disappointed with that, 
clicked over and started watching X Men ninety seven and holy shit, I watched the first episode, the first two episodes of uh, of ninety seven, and uh, it is probably one of the most uh, in depth, complicated um, 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 narrative spaces in any show that I've seen in recent history. Uh, I I used to watch X Men back in the nineties, sure. Uh, but uh, I'd I'd say they are they've they have moved the uh, they've progressed the storyline incredibly well for uh, uh, advancing the content that was left off in the '90s. It's just it really is just it it deserves a lot of praise. It is it is mature. It is complicated subjects. None of the characters have an easy path. There's holy shit stuff happening. Just in the first two episodes, there's been a lot of holy shit moments. Uh, the use of their powers is incredibly clever. Like they were in a, they were doing a, a battle in uh, in the desert, and uh, Storm used lightning to turn all of this, uh, like a shitload of sand into glass, and then uh, and then wep- uh, and then used a, a hurricane to uh, uh, weaponize that glass into projectiles to shred the targets that she was attacking. Super fucking cool stuff. Morph is doing. I, I never was really interested in Morph as a character, and I was concerned about him being a sort of slapsticky sort of thing. But it's I like Morph a lot. Uh, AA turns into like all all the like the B cast X Men. Like he's constantly turning into other types of X Men to, to borrow from their abilities to to attack opponents, which is which is like a really clever way of inserting cameos of beloved X-Men or mutants in general that, that they don't necessarily want to devote plot time to, but pay homage to. It's just an excellent solution there. And, um, um, yeah, uh, the way that uh, Gambit and Wolverine work together. Cyclops is just a fucking monster. He's... Just an absolute war beast. So fucking cool. I have, I have, outside of the comics, I have not seen um, um, Cyclops be such a hostile force on the battlefield. It is, a, it is really nice to see how much the writers thought about how these um, expert combatants with mutant abilities are really using their using what they have to just be creative and adaptive and reactive and um, I'd say responsive not reactive super cool shit highly highly recommend that that the, the new X97 too cool looking forward to the uh, yeah, hopefully the hopefully the episodes sustain themselves I'm looking forward to seeing more of these. That something seems wrong there. One, two, three, four, five. This is supposed to be asteroid cluster six. Let's go back and look at this. There's nine of those. here before I lose track of this. Mapping tools, icons, asteroids, Yogi Hunt Rock, Yogi Rocks. There we go. Now I can sally forth. Did I grab this one already?
Yeah, yeah, I did. <sighs> Herbalplex. I do need some more clusters, so let's just keep let's just keep clustering for a bit. There. Legit pretty fun. Let's go find a rock to drop in there. Merge down. Let me give this guy a twist. Sometimes I whistle when I use my W's. What's up with that? Hey there, Timely Timer. Keeping time for me, eh? It probably is time for me to take a sip, huh? All right. Where are we at? We're at uh, 11 o'clock. Okay, I've still got 20 minutes. We can just keep punching out some assets here. Once, uh, So once we run out of time today... I'll just drop all these into uh, into the zip file and then I'll reload it. So um, if you're here live with me now, you can expect to have these assets sitting in the zip file in about less than an hour. And if you're in the future, these things should all be in there. So if you've been watching the stream, you're seeing the path that um, the, the file path that you take to get to the assets. They're in the mapping assets. So there you go. bit I'm not a fan of assembly work in general, but I, I recognize that if I want to ever build a business out of this, I need to be willing to do assembly work instead of just pure creation. Creation is great, but then it needs to be integrated into assembly work so that it can be packaged into a product. I hate packaging. I hate it. Just do not like spending time doing that stuff. But if I can, if I can learn a way to instead of hating that process, uh, learning to appreciate how packaging can be its own expression of art, uh, kind of like how graphic design is, maybe I can get to a place where I'm excited about packaging assets. Saw some artifacts in there. I wanted to chop that up a little bit. Well, artifacts. Uh, did I say artifacts or did I say assets? I intended to say artifacts. I feel like I said assets. But regardless, regardless, I want to 
break up the surface of this a little bit. So lean into it, Kearney, huh? Just leaning on into it. Plus to seven. Two more clusters, and then actually, yeah, I can do two more clusters, and then we'll go find those other assets. So what was I looking for? 79, 54, okay, cool. So let's go to Spelljammer, Production, Interior Pages, 78 is going to be Exploration, no. Um, oh, that's right, uh, system generator. For now, let's go to find page. Well, there we are. How about that? Let's duplicate that layer into Untitled 3. No, let's not save that. Zoom out here, we'll go to Free Transform. Let's um, merge that group, and then we can scooch.
let's do that. And then let's start peeling these apart. little cluster. We can file, save as, PNG, production, spell jammer, final, maps and tokens, Mapping tools, icons, asteroids, asteroid 10. Yes. Okay, seal that and dump dump down to there. Let's go back to open, asteroid 10. And now we can image. Nope image crop and then image canvas size pixels clean up here. Chop up and grid up the edges a little bit here. I like this one. I love all my little rock children. Nice. Save. Drop.
good. Also pretty good. Mush that down a little bit here just to give it a little bit more grittiness as we do. Yeah, I like that. That looks good. And here. And here. All right, we're on our last 20 minute kick. So I'm going to take a sip of coffee here. the pixelation That's a fun little cluster. Let's do that. File, save as equals PNG. Yeah. Cluster eight. I hope everyone is having an opportunity to have a decent little study hall. Kind of chillax in a quiet space here and kick back and relax a little bit on a Sunday, on a Saturday.
here and then this will be our next cluster and then we can go into the other pages and extract rocks from those as well 20 minutes left we should be able to get all these assets done and then i'll package them up and have them in the zip file for people that purchase the uh Combat Exploration Supplement. Uh, these will be added to that asset packet. And then um, when I have some free time, we'll make a, uh, like I was saying, we'll make that standalone product with a lot more rocks included just to give you a lot more. Do do do. Nice. So the uh, the asteroid belt campaign, uh, the the game uh, the game system that we built to run that Spelljammer, Ebron game. Um, it leans heavily on uh, ability checks, replacing almost every other type of resolution mechanic. And um, it's very 4E in that flavor, except that it's like a super loose narrative flavor where there's not a lot of rules other than you're either interacting or observing things. Now, so basically, what, what, the way that we have action economy broken up right now, there's movement. So you know, you can move. And you can move to something within 50 feet as part of your round, or uh, sorry, uh, you can move to something that's within 20 feet of you uh, as a free movement during your round. And you can spend the one action that you have per round to move to something that's up to 50 feet away. Uh, anything that's further than 50 feet away is going to take more than one round to get there. Um, the act, you get one action per round per person. Period. And those actions are, again, far movement, um, casting a spell or activating a, a relic. Same thing, a, rel a spell is something that you know, a relic is something that's, uh, that the spell is stored in an object. But the, but the uh, effect of, but the, um, the action economy is the same. It's just what's the source. Um, you, can, you, can kit, you can purchase multiple relics to carry into adventure with you, but you only know so many spells at a time. So that's the difference. And uh, let's see, um, there's uh, attacking, which takes an action to attack something. Whether you have a, a single target thing or you can do an AOE, it doesn't really distinguish between the two right now. It's just an attack and what kind of weapon do you have to attack with. Uh, and then there is um, observing and interacting. And observations have been, uh, observing has been uh, broken into something you can do for free casually like what's on what's on that desk it's like it looks like a couple books a ledger uh and a stack of receipts like that i can tell you for free but if you want to like i want to i want to flip through the books to see what's there that is going to be a, that would be your action to interact with or observe the things that are on that table so there's objects there's observing and then there's interacting and interacting can also include like i want to open a door That'd be like a free action to open the door, unless it's like locked, barred, or held somehow, in which case it would like require you effort to interact with it, in which case that would take your action. I wanna force this door open. So that's currently how it's broken down. Casting, or relics, uh, movement, attacking, observing, interacting. And interactions and observations and interactions are broken into three pieces. You're either observing or interacting with a person, a place, or a thing, or rather creatures, environments, and objects. You can observe objects, you can observe creatures, you can observe environments, you can interact with objects, you can interact with creatures, and you can interact with environments. So either passively or as an active, or as your action. But, uh, and then there's attacking, right? And But I'm thinking that we can, we can dissolve attacking into interaction. And the interaction then because uh, then becomes I, uh, then becomes I'm attacking that creature, or I'm using this object to attack with, or I'm attacking inside this space. Like uh, like if you're going to attack, 
because because different um, um, the like you gain like ex like uh, in in five E language you gain expert like each type of class has expertise in a different type of uh, of action. Like uh, you can have expertise in casting and using relics. You can have expertise in attacking. You can have a expertise in uh, in interacting with objects. You can have expertise in observing environments. You can have expertise in, in observing or interacting with creatures. So it has this, hey, super, it's good to see you. So there, there's this, there's only like these five types of action economy, well, including movement. There's basically only six type of actions that you can take during a round. But uh, the way that I've been thinking lately is instead of having like a specialized action to be attacking, instead just make that, uh, make attacking an interaction effect. So if you if your character has um, expertise in interactions with environment, if you want to attack and gain expertise, you have to describe how your attack is using the environment to damage your opponent. Like like one like if you're fighting like if you've got swords or whatever sword and board and like a like a like an archer and a caster. And you're fighting an ogre in a cavern. One person that has expertise in interacting with with creatures could say, "I attack the ogre, and I want and I'm going to use my expertise in um, in interacting with creatures to like attack his weak spot. Like I want to like I want to kneecap him because I'm going to use his anatomy against him to weaken his defenses. So I attack him by kneecapping him, and then you gain expertise in your die roll." If you don't, if instead you're like, I shoot them, like with my gun, it's like that's framing the action as the weapon that you're using. If you don't have expertise in objects, then it would just be a normal die roll. But if your character has expertise in, in guns or like, it, like expertise in interacting with objects, instead you could frame it as, I'm going to brace and fire a volley of shots into the, into the torso of the ogre. It's an easy target. I want to saturate it with bullets. That would be a narrative that you could use to gain expertise in your object interaction. And then another character could be like, uh, I want to, um, I want to attack the ogre. Uh, I want to trip it so that it hits its head on a stalactite. That would be using the inner, the environment as your expertise, knowing the battlefield and how can I use that battlefield to my advantage. Or like it, it could be like um, if you're using a gun and you have expertise in environments, instead of just firing a volley of bullets at the uh, at the ogre uh, as an object interaction, you could instead say, "I want to shoot! I want to shoot at the ground and its feet." So not only could I maybe tag it with some bullets, but I can kick up a bunch of dirt to distract it and to and to give my allies advantage somehow. And they wouldn't like they may not actually get advantage in doing so, but. Uh, using the environment against the ogre would allow you to use your expertise in environments. So that would disintegrate the need to have expertise in combat, uh, like expertise in attacking. I could dissolve the warrior class altogether and, and then reduce it down to like um, specialists that interact with objects, environments, and creatures and have combat just be a part of whether or not you get to use that expertise. So it would it would de-emphasize combat as a role, but it would still allow you to think of clever ways in combat to gain use of the expertise or or advantages that your that the character class that you choose has. So it's it's a way of changing the way the action economy and uh, and decision making on the characters is framed to use simpler mechanics, but to diversify the things that you can do. And and the the and I'm a I'm a very uh, in, uh, investigation and uh, an exploration um, DM. Like seventy percent of the stuff that I do is is interacting with and observing things in the environment. So naturally, I, I'd create a game system that emphasizes interaction and observations and then breaking down the economy of like what your target is of persons like creatures environments and objects 
So yeah, so that's anyway, that's been on my mind. Uh, I haven't implemented it yet because we're only on our second mission and I wanted to give them a chance to uh, to explore um, ob uh, um, task resolution using those five different modes. And like if you have expertise in spell casting, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna use my spell to, to, to blast that ogre. And then, you know, since you're using spell power to do it, then you would have expertise in that role. So those are currently, um, those, those are currently the, the the different modes that exist. Observing, interacting, attacking, casting. And then movement's like a non-thing. But it eats up your action economy to reposition yourself. Maybe, uh, maybe I should add in a perk. Like while, if you spend your entire action moving, um, you have uh, advantage on defense rolls. Maybe that makes sense. That might make sense to, to give people, uh, to reward people to spend their action moving. They could reposition themselves, but but be defended while they're doing it. That I think would feel good. Yeah, that's. Uh, oh, you're, you're talking about the action economy that I'm talking about. Yeah, that's the that's the Eberron, um, the uh, Eberron asteroid belt campaign that I'm running right now. So um, I, if you check my playlists. Uh, the uh, the uh, orbit uh, uh, the orbit campaign uh, that I streamed last month like there's like 13 episodes it was basically building that system up basically from scratch and uh, and so far it's working really well so it's a very light fast narrative mechanical system that can be implemented in almost any kind of setting uh, but it really it's it's just it's just ability checks. I think I can. I think I can squeeze these in a little bit more. Like that. That feels good. And then we can save this as a cluster file. Save as PNG. Here and we got image crop and then image canvas size inches pixels 250 50 But yeah, so far the playtesting is working really, really well. So they're on their, they're about to start the second mission. Uh, they, uh, we went through the uh, the guild, uh, the guild update. They had uh, eight, they had gained eight resources. So they decided to purchase two new territories so they could expand their mining operation and accumulate resources more quickly. The only way you gain experience and wealth in in this game system is by extracting ore from asteroids and territories that you control that then gets converted into resource points that your characters can spend to invest in addition ter additional territories or they can invest points into upgrading the rank of their facility and then once you once you ascend like there's five ranks uh, first rank requires one resource second rank requires four third rank requires nine 16 and then 25 for fifth rank fifth rank is the top it's like it's like the the, the proficiency modifiers plus two through plus six is a five rank system just like half casting in uh, in dnd 5e is a five rank system from spell casting level one at first then five nine 13 17 that's your five ranks uh which we use in the spell jammer combat and exploration supplement to uh, define the rank of commander and rank of crew that you have. The crew gains ranks by accumulating renown through surviving combat encounters, which we, we spent some time in a video that I published talking about crew ranks and lifestyles. And, uh, and so this game system leans into that rank idea where you're, where you're increasing the rank of your guild to have better command die rolls to like mine rocks as a commerce check using your your rank and commerce 
plus ability score modifier. So like you'd roll like a D20, like it's set, like their second rank right now in commerce. So their ability to extract wealth from asteroids as a mining operation, uh, they roll a D6 plus a D20 plus two for their rank. And then whatever that result is, is measured against the difficulty of the rock that they're attempting to mine. Like, um, like currently, like last, uh, uh, last adventure, their priority was to mine a plat uh, an asteroid with platinum in it. And uh, while copper only requires like a, a DC 10 to extract ore from, no, it's a seven, seven, no, it's, it's, it's one, one, seven, 13, 19, 25, 13, that's, that's not right. There, I'm off. Hold on. Oh, it's, it's, it's 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22, 25, 28, 31. And that's my timer. So um, uh, platinum is a DC 19. So they have to D20 plus D6 plus two. If they roll a 19 or better, they successfully extract uh, um, platinum ore and it's worth three resources every 10 days that they do that. But every 10 days, the rocks move from one territory to another. So once they run out of, once a rock is out of territory, they have to, and they have to spend points. They have to spend resources to chase after the rock to keep mining it. And often it's worth it. Um, but um, they didn't, they failed the die roll. So the miners can't extract the ore from the platinum asteroid until the problem is resolved. And that failed die roll at the guild level is what creates the adventures for the characters. So they did, they did, uh, they used clairvoyance to survey incoming rocks. And they discovered that the, uh, that the neighboring elven um, nation has uh, occupied one of their territories with warships. And so they, because they failed the, they, they failed the, uh, the scry check for that specific, each territory, you make a check, a scry check to see what's there. And then once you determine what's there at the end of that 10 day, at the beginning of the 10 day, you do a lore check, um, using lore and they're only first rank in lore. So the D20 plus four plus one, uh, plus D4 plus one to determine what's there. And they'll always find out what's there, but if they fail the die roll, they're like, yeah, there's a, there's like, say there's a, there's a rock of gold coming in, but since they failed the die roll, but there's a problem. And then the DM decides what the problem is. It's like, we know there's a gold rock there, but for some reason, an elven fleet of uh, uh, elven warships are sitting on it. So we can't actually go in and mine it until we do something about the elven warships. So the team has the option of making, dealing with the elven warships an adventure. And that adventure could be combat, using military force, they jump into fighter craft and they actually fight the elven warships. If they beat them, then they reclaim the territory and they can mine it. They could use diplomacy, visit the elven embassy and ask, why are you camping our territory and what do we need to do to resolve this? And it becomes a diplomacy mission where they can find out more information about what's important to the elves by asking and shooting later, because they could always shoot later. And then the third option is uh, an espionage mission where they send scouts in stealthily to try to spy on the, on the elves and find out what are they doing there. And a successful mission will them not getting, it will be them not getting captured and leaning into observing what's going on and potentially using some object interactions with relics and stuff to like, like trigger like stealth mode in the, in the stealth fighter that they're in or whatever. So there's, so, so there's some different interactions that they can do there and they can approach that challenge in different ways. Meanwhile, back at that platinum rock, uh, their first adventure was uh, our miners were being killed and we need to find out why. Well, they found out there was poisonous spores in the belly, uh, in the kyber zone of the, of the asteroid inside its belly. And, uh, and they found that there was insects in there that interacted with the, uh, with the spores but they also, those bugs would dissolve rock because they ate the rock, but they didn't eat the minerals. So there was all this just open ore of platinum just laying around. It was like all fused in these organic shapes that were basically jutting out of the rock that hadn't been eaten yet. They're like, 
okay, so if we can take control of this rock and figure out how these bugs work, maybe we can train the bugs to make extracting ore from rocks much easier in the future, but they ended up fucking up and they had to get out. So they at least reported what they found there. And so that would that they finished the adventure, they survived, they brought back information that triggered at the end of that 10 day, another um, uh, mining operation check, but they failed the die roll on the mine. So the logical conclusion was, well, you didn't get rid of the bugs, they're still in there. And now they're pissed off because you went and poked at them. So the miners know the platinum's there and they're in position to get it, but the bugs are preventing them to do so. So the team had the choice. You could either focus your adventure on dealing with the elves, or you could focus your adventure on round two with the bugs. So like, well, we want those bugs and we want the platinum. So let's go, let's go tear after the bugs. That means that dealing with the elves, they now decide, is it, ex is it going to be an espionage mission, a diplomacy mission, or a military mission and it will be a single die roll using either their loyalty industry as diplomats uh their uh, lore check as um as espionage or their military industry check as a uh, as a military operation to fight them they think they're gonna fail if they try to do military because the elves vastly outnumber them and have a much larger territory so they're thinking either they're going to use espionage or diplomacy. And since it's a single die roll, if they succeed the die roll, they're going to be able to have a solution. Uh, if they succeed in the espionage check, they'll find out what's going on with the elves, but not necessarily shake them loose. If they succeed in the diplomacy check, they'll find out why the elves are there and what they need through diplomacy and be offered a solution as to how they they could be quelled so that they'll give up the territory. But if they fail the die roll, then they're not going to gain any information and they're going to escalate the threat. And then militarily, if they succeed the die roll, they'll successfully drive the elves out through force, you know, through force of arms, but could potentially trigger war. And if they fail the die roll, their 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 squadron of fighters will be eliminated and they're escalating combat with the elves. So they're thinking combat is a bad idea. So they're leaning into either espionage or diplomacy. And they think that diplomacy is probably going to create the better solution. So I think they're going to end up doing that. But since the guild is doing it, whatever the result is creates another point of, uh, creates another adventure opportunity, either escalating the good that they've done so far or, or it, it escalates the bad situation that now becomes worse. So they can only do one adventure at a time, but every time they fail a die roll in lore, observing the asteroids, or uh, in the um, commerce check of extracting wealth, every time they fail a die roll, it creates a new challenge that they have to resolve to get the resources. Every time they succeed the check, they gain access to the resources. They can add it to their resource stack that they can then spend to gain new territories, uh, increase the rank of their industries, purchase new uh, relics or a larger spell book so they have more uh, adventuring options when they go in as individual characters. Um, or they can research things or, or just delve for secrets by investing points in different industries. So, so far it's working out so far, but uh, we have to play it for a number of, uh, a number of adventures to see if it's es like, is it escalating to the point that it's too much chaos or, or, or does it naturally resolve itself well and it's creating a natural emergent gameplay style? Because I don't know where the challenges are going to be on the map until they make the die roll. And they don't know what challenges I'm going to prevent until uh, present until they know what the results of the die rolls were. So it's a very, very loose um, Dominion style system that's very fast and intuitive to use. You just make a couple die rolls every 10 days and that frames what adventure options are posed to the group for the next 10 days. And depending on how they resolve their individual adventure and the NPCs that they allocate another die roll to resolve the adventures they couldn't personally handle is how the campaign escalates in, in, um, in success or failures and where new conflicts and, and alliances can arise. So that's the idea. Like if they, like if they did a diplomacy check they, and they do well on the die roll, they could, the elves could end up asking them to help 
solve whatever the problem it is. And then they can decide to make that their personal quest to help them or, yeah, we'll help you. Here's a squad of spelunkers that can help you find what you're looking for or whatever it ends up being. So that's, that's the idea there. Asteroid cluster, that's a good looking cluster. We'll go with that. And I'm gonna save this as file, save as stack. We're gonna call this um, rock stack workbench. Let's go back to open. So here's all the assets that we created that we'll add into the folder. Um, we got uh, 10 uh, standalone asteroids and we've got nine. I'll probably add in another cluster, but I've ran out of time. So I got to bounce. It's 1145. Uh, it's brunchy time in my world. So I'll be back Monday morning. We're going to continue working on the Eberron map. I'll be back at lunch. We'll continue working on the Ravnica Rubble Belt campaign. And I'll be back Monday night. We'll continue working on Vocast Mega Crab. Um, I'm going to have these things uploaded probably in an hour or so uh, into the asset pack of these as well as the, um, and then just uh, to cap off today's session, I will go to ships and we added the, uh, the weapon and gear tokens. So these are all tokens now that are included. I'm going to add these to the zip file, package that all up, and then uh, reload that onto, um, here's the Spelljammer Combat and Exploration. As you can see, it has both a PDF and it has a zip file. So I'm going to add all these, uh, all these assets that we've been building during this session. I'm going to add these to the zip file. So you can keep an eye out for that. Uh, it'll be updated probably in the next couple hours. And, uh, and then I'll probably continue extracting. Uh, and then the rest of the day I'm going to spend on Eberron. So thanks a lot for being here, guys. Uh, I hope you had fun. Uh, like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications in the future. If you think this stuff is cool and you want to see more of the stuff that I do and um, hear more about the things that I build. So, um, yeah, I'll see you guys on the other side. Thanks a lot. Laters. Uh, how do I get out?